Hey everyone, welcome back to another one of the Cardboard Herald's Quarantine Solo Diaries, where we pick a solo gaming focused subject, talk about it a bit, and then talk about what sort of solo shenanigans I've been getting up to since we last recorded one of these. And you can tell we're pretty deep in this series based off of the hefty length of beard. I have become more beard than man at this point. And while we're talking about stylistic changes, yes, this is what I look like without glasses. No, you don't see it very often, and no, it's not a stylistic choice because I broke my glasses a couple days ago and have to wait for some new ones to come in. So I guess that'll happen, but the channel continues and here we are today. I got my contacts. Let's roll with it. So today's topic is something that I was actually asked online on Twitter, which I thought was a brilliant idea for a video. What do I want to see in solo board games? And what do I want to see less of in solo board games is kind of the flip side of that. But we're kind of addressing all that here. What do I want out of this particular type of gaming in the future as I experience more of these games and as more games come out? So the first thing that I want to see more of in the future is more interpretive solo games. These are games where they aren't necessarily just solitaire games. They're trying to simulate the experience of playing the multiplayer version without having to fully go through the painstaking conducting of a automated opponent with a ton of rule set. And the best of these really account for the, the spirit, the very essence of the game, and what are the best elements of the player interaction during multiplayer, and thinking of ways to, without leaving a decision on your part as the player, how those might impact you and, and, and be woven into the very nature of the solo experience. Now this can be done in a ton of different ways and I don't think any game is really exempt from this. I mean you see it in area control games like Scythe and Root are great examples of games that have good solo uh, modes at this point with the better bot project and clockwork expansion for Root. And then you also have worker placement games like uh, Everdell has a great version of this where it's really streamlined, it's very smart how it's handled, and it just makes it so you have progressively less and less options to choose from, from among the cards on display. Certain cards are going to be taken away and certain spots are going to be inaccessible to you. It's a very light touch that is, I think, better than something like, say, Caverna, which we talked about last time, where there is really no sense of someone else competing for a space for you, simulated or otherwise, which just makes it what path do you want to take to get the most points. Now, the second thing that I want to talk about is specific to a genre. Now, there have been so many cool solo games out there, but one type of game that I haven't really felt like ha has been fully explored as far as solo games is the, the the like vast area control game with heavy player interaction. The type of game that I'm thinking about is maybe Game of Thrones second edition, a game with a lot of political intrigue and, and player interaction where you know going in you're going to have to do a lot of conquest in order to get a foothold. And I think Eclipse is another title like this. I mean, I have Eclipse... A second Dawn for the Galaxy, the, the second edition sitting on the table over here, and I was honestly surprised to see that it didn't at least make some sort of attempt for an automated opponent. Now this is a really big game and it's got a ton of components and maybe attempts were made and it just didn't bear fruit, but I was kind of surprised that with the diehard love there is for Eclipse out there and for Game of Thrones 2nd Edition, that there haven't really been fully popularized attempts at making solo modes that aren't just, well, you can play with two factions against one another and pretend they don't know what they're doing. I don't know. I'm not the game designer, so I don't know if that's a particularly tough nut to crack, but I want to see more of those types of games really undergo how to make those 
viable solo games. Number three on the list is better victory conditions than just scoring a bunch of points. I hate to pick on you, Caverna, but come on, just setting the bar at 100 points and get as many as you can and either you made it or you didn't feels kind of lame. And there are a lot of games like that out there. And I always feel like it's a little bit lazy, like it's something that could be addressed in some better way. Yes, the experience of playing the game is inherently fun and that's why I wanted to do it, but I want some sort of variability in the outcome and to, to have some sort of objective to reach for when I'm playing the game that makes for interesting decisions that aren't just how to get the most points. And that's not to say that points are inherently bad. I mean, one of the games I'm going to talk about a little bit later is Sagrada, and Sagrada handles this brilliantly in that as you play the game, the dice that you don't draft into your pool actually count as the score that you are comparing yourself against at the end of the game. It's a really interesting system that does so much more than just saying how many points can I possibly bang out by the end of this game. Number four, well, number four is probably the most symptomatic of me becoming more and more of a solo gamer. Don't get me wrong, I normally play multiplayer games when given my choice, and I do try to get opportunities to play with people, even during quarantine. People who are part of my quarantine bubble, my wife, you know, like I play online games, but this is something that shows that I have started to become a stubborn solo gamer, and that's don't gate away so much of your content for solo games. That is, again, something that feels inherently lazy like you you didn't want to put in the effort to account for a bunch of your game now don't get me wrong i get it there are going to be some things that just don't work in solo games and so a portion of your game can be set aside but there are a lot of solo games out there that are like here are the rules for the multiplayer game and then for the solo game take out half the game, and that game is no longer accessible to you. Just ignore that. You're no longer going to get to play with any of those toys, and then you only get to play with this. What that tells me is that either you didn't care about the solo gamers, or you just didn't want to spend the time thinking about how to best utilize this stuff in a solo game. And what that does for me as a reviewer is makes it so that I have to point out that if you were considering this game purely to play solo, just forget it because I don't want you to have a bunch of wasted stuff on your shelf. And the last thing is something that just occurred to me during quarantine, something that I had never considered before. I want to see more solo games for kids. And yeah, there are a couple, but while we were in quarantine mode and my wife and I are working from home and we're trying to also balance care of our child, there is more time than he has had in the past of just hanging out by himself. And he loves board games. And I witnessed my son start to play board games by himself. And he was playing them as if there were two or three people or trying to set up his own challenges, which I'm incredibly proud of him for doing that. And it reminded me that I did that a lot as a kid. So why aren't there actually compelling solo games for this, this age set between four to eight years old before you start branching into the, the standard hobby games? There are some out there, but for as many cool, awesome hobby games that there are for kids, I'm really surprised that there aren't a, a lot of developed and interesting uh, solo modes. And that's going to do it for the things that I most want to see in the future of solo games. But I want to hear what are your own thoughts on what you want to see out of the horizon of this growing section of our hobby. But, of course, as always, we talk about the games that I've been playing most recently, give you kind of the skinny on the different solo modes for things that are hitting the table in Casa de Cardboard Herald. And today we got four new games to talk about. The first one is one that we've already talked about a bunch, so I'm going to make it real short on that. That's Terraforming Mars. Now, 
how this is one of the games that opened my eyes to solo modes in the first place because it has that really cool uh, victory condition that is so much more compelling than just getting a certain number of points, but there's a consequence to that. So in Terraforming Mars, what you're trying to do is to fully terraform the planet, get the three terraforming parameters uh, knocked out by a certain number of rounds, depending on whether you're playing with Prelude or not. And you should be playing with Prelude because that's one of the most brilliant expansions to anything anywhere. But the thing that is kind of wonky about that as you see more solo games is that it completely disrupts the uh, value proposition of a lot of cards that are in the game because there are some cards that have direct impact on opponents that have virtually no meaning at this point or the cost is way too high to justify what you're doing and points don't matter at all. And there's a lot of cards in Terraforming Mars that are based around getting points. But what is at the core of Terraforming Mars, the thing that makes it the best, is that even in the solo mode, you still have that extremely good feeling of developing this pristine engine that just balloons to an absolute monstrosity and when you're given no shackles whatsoever by other opponents or having to worry about points, it can get really crazy when you are responsible for terraforming the entire planet yourself. And I think that's the trade-off that really works well for that game. Then I also talked about Sagrada earlier. Now, Sagrada is one of those games that early on when I was reviewing it, I thought, hey, to be a comprehensive reviewer, I want to also review the solo mode. And it's awesome. I love the solo mode in that game. There are, again, some problems with it, some things that aren't the best, uh, but the pure, simple experience of having to draw four dice at a time and you pick which two you're going to draft and any dice that you don't use are therefore added to the track and whatever dice are left on the track at the end of the game, the pips on those represent the score that you have to beat. And it makes so much more of an interesting decision around what you're going to do in order to account for me getting the most points, limiting their points, and uh, being able to fill out your tableau because you can kind of get yourself into a position where the noose is growing tighter and tighter around your neck as you're having fewer and fewer viable options for things to put on that tableau. And that's one of the cool things about the game in the first place. Now, one of the problems with Sagrada is something that suffers at two players as well as it does at single player is that you're using the entire bag of dice, but you're only going to be drawing a, a very few of them. So in a, a game that I think has 90 dice normally, you're drawing 40 dice over 10 rounds for the solo mode. And so if you have the victory conditions, in this case, you get two of the, the color-based victory points uh, at the end of the game, you can end up in a situation where you just didn't really draw a lot of green or yellow or whatever. It doesn't undermine the solo game entirely because it's so quick and easy to play. It's about 20 minutes and you still are making the best of whatever situations are presented to you. Uh, but that's uh, another example of a game where as cool as it is and as much as I think of it as among my favorite solo games, there are things that uh, about the game as designed that suffer under the solo experience. Now, the third thing here is a scaling game, a game that that works brilliantly as it grows based off of the number of players. It's intended to be something that from the get-go could be played with only one player, and that's Marvel Champions. Now, for those of you who have been in the industry and the hobby for a long time, you know that this is kind of like a, a re-implementation of some of the systems from the Lord of the Rings LCG. It has some of the elements of the Arkham Horror LCG. This is fantasy flight games kind of reusing some of those ideas with Marvel's superheroes. It's a cooperative game and you can play it solo in my preference as just one hero, one deck, so that way I'm not having to manage multiple decks. If you wanted to, you could totally do that. 
but everything about the game has the enemies scaling their life totals and, and some of the various effects of things that they do uh, based off of the number of heroes that are in the game. And it just works so seamlessly and so well to sit down and say, all right, I'm going to do, I, I don't know, Captain Marvel versus Rhino right now, or I'm going to do uh, She-Hulk or Spider-Man versus Ultron right now. Uh, the game overall has really simple systems in it compared to especially Lord of the Rings LCG. That makes the deck building a little bit easier. And as a solo player, that makes me want to get more invested in it. It doesn't have the thematic punch that a, a deep, deep immersive game like Arkham or uh, Lord of the Rings LCG has. But I'm a Marvel superheroes nerd, and so I, I do love playing with them. Like, my, they're my action figures. And having this challenging and interesting and dynamic, but overall fairly casual playtime with them. Now, the last game that I'm going to talk about is Catacombs cubes. Now, a lot of you are familiar with Catacombs because it's the dexterity-based dungeon delve where you're flicking discs as if you were in a dungeon crawl game, but Catacombs Cubes is a game where it's more like an economic euro where it uses building blocks as resources. Now, Catacombs Cubes is an example of what I was talking about earlier, where it's hard to recommend getting a game purely based off of the solo experience because it just gates away a ton of content behind the multiplayer mode. Like, especially if you are getting the um, the expansion that comes with it, it says, all right, the green tiles, you're never going to use those. The personal tiles, you're never going to use those. Uh, you're going to not use the dice because you have to use the chits. If you're playing the solo mode in order to keep the economy right, you have to replace all the uh, the the four block chits from the base game with the four block chits from the expansion. Whereas normally, if you were playing multiplayer, you'd combine it all, and then you take out all the special actions from the the base game that are not effective in the solo game. Personally, I just throw all those chits in one pile, and if I draw one that isn't supposed to be drawn, then I toss it out. Now, why am I talking about this? Um, one, because I played it, and two, even though I wouldn't recommend getting it just based off of the solo game, because so much is gated away, it's a really good solo game. Like, <laughs> I really enjoy it. Uh, the inherent fun of building up the different uh, buildings using the blocks that are available to you and viewing them as logistical resources is really cool. It's uh, something that's great in multiplayer and is great in solo. I personally prefer the multiplayer with dice, but in solo using the chits is done in a really cool system where you draw three chits, you flip over two of them, leave one face down, and you go, do I wanna keep the two that are face up? Or do I wanna flip the other one face up, forcing me to keep that one and one of the others? And then the automated opponent is going to move up the point track based off of the number of cubes involved. So, you know, like if a large square is four cubes or uh, uh, like, arrow shape is three, you know, tetromino type of stuff um, goes up based off of the one that wasn't used. Similarly, if you take the two face up ones without looking at the face down one, then afterwards you flip that up and the opponent moves up the track based off of that. And then anytime that the automated opponent meets certain levels on the point track, they're going to snake one of the uh, buildings from the available building area. Again, simulating the experience of someone scooping up the buildings that you may have been working towards. And in one of the coolest moves, the game acknowledges that if that spot that the, the game is going to snake one of either the blue spot, red spot, or silver spot has already been built by you, then they don't actually get to add that to the, the automated player's kingdom. The reason this is really important is because even though this game has one of those scoring metrics at the end saying, oh, at this level you got this, at this level you got this, and you were awarded this grand builder title, whatever. The important thing is, is that your score is the amount of points in your kingdom as normal less 
the score of the automated opponent. So again, it has that fluidity, that variability where you're having to consider something other than just maximizing your own personal points and just driving towards one goal. And so even though it kind of gatekeeps a lot of things and it also is a little bit of a bear to set up compared to a lot of my favorite solo games, it's actually really compelling and I've had a lot of fun with it. I'm just really glad that I'll also have a lot of fun with it multiplayer so I can get use out of some of the really cool stuff that isn't used in the solo mode. And that's it. Those are the games that I've been playing. I know this was kind of a bigger topic than normal. We had a lot to cover today, so I hope that you have enjoyed another episode of our Quarantine Solo Diaries. We'll probably have more because, you know, it's not looking like things are necessarily getting better out there, even though things are reopening. So all I'm going to leave it with is stay safe, stay healthy, have a lot of fun, and stay positive. Thank you for watching the Cardboard Herald. If you enjoyed this video, we have all kinds of other reviews, interviews, and recommendations via writing, podcasts, and video here on our channel and website CardboardHerald.com. Our content is audience-supported, so if you want to show your support, please visit our Patreon. Thank you so much for watching. This has been the Cardboard Herald.